Hey, good morning. Good morning, Mike. How are you this morning? Doing good, Eric. Did you you obviously you made it back, or are you still up in Charleston? No, no, I'm down here in Charleston. Well, I'm at the Greenbrier, but uh, for the business summit. Uh, hey, I just got a question. How was the other segment before this one? Because you know, I was all eager to come on, and I got bumped. <laughs> Kent Leonard bumped him. Ooh, see, that's what happens when you're a politician on the way out the door. You're see, no longer needed. <laughs> see, it's it's whoever responds first is who gets oh, these okay. slots. Okay. you got to realize. <laughs> In fairness, Eric, you did tell me that 905 worked better for you. Yeah, it does. It does, yeah. Give me a chance to have a little breakfast and get get downstairs and see everybody. But, uh, no, glad to be on the show. Yeah, what are you guys doing at the Greenbrier? This is the... Uh, the next couple of days is the business summit, and uh, it is uh, extremely busy. A lot of speakers. Um, obviously, U.S. Senator uh, Manchin Capito, Congresswoman, uh, was here. Uh, so you know, just business people. Is that put uh, on by the chamber, or is it put it on is by the put state? On by the West Virginia, no, West Virginia Chamber of Commerce. A lot of people here. Uh, they've seen an increase in, in enrollment. And so far, so good. So Patrick Morrissey was one of the key, keynote speakers yesterday. Did a fabulous job. Did a really good job. Really proud of him. So really laid out his message. So very excited for him. I believe the governor um, announced a few um, economic development projects. Upshur County, I know Berkeley County got one. Uh, was that announced down there publicly or was that just through was, press release? It was. In fact, he started off with uh, Prime 6 a company that's coming to uh, Buchanan, and they make a charcoal wood product. And then right out of the gate, the next one up was Handcraft Services, you know, a provider of, of medical linen. He said coming to Berkeley County, they're investing 59220 jobs. And then, of course, the last one was the $126 million investment in Mason County for the Hydrogen Hub, uh, a company, Babcock and Wilcox. And uh, so a lot of great things happening in the state of West Virginia. So very excited. Yeah, we're going to talk with Jennifer Smith and Mitch Carmichael next segment about that economic development announcement yesterday Good. in Berkeley County, uh, too, Good. And, Good. And, and tap on the other ones as well. Eric, you sent me uh, uh, what looked to be like your calculus homework uh, the other day. <laughs> and yep. this is the tax trigger math as to how this is all deciphered in regards to what percentage of a tax cut happens with the personal income tax. Right. All right, so the formula is based on fiscal year 19 total revenues minus severance taxes. That's correct. All right, correct. This, this number and, is always used to determine if there's a tax cut or not a tax cut. That's right. So that is our base total general revenue for 2019. So we will always use that $4 billion Two hundred ninety-three million eight hundred eighty-four thousand seven hundred fifty-four dollar number here moving forward to determine a tax cut, right. and you will always use the CPI number for fiscal year nineteen. But I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, it says step one: you take the CPI number for FY twenty-four. Sorry, I had to cough. Yes, and divide it by the CPI number for FY nineteen. That's right, and remember that. The CPI number, obviously, every month, it's for a 12-month, they, they get an average. So for fiscal year 24, that average was 309.57. Well, fiscal year two, uh, 2019 was 253.26. You will always use that 253.26. And all that is telling you, you know, the, the CPI is a group, it's an index of, uh, of a basically 100 consumer goods and, and services. And back in, I guess, the 80s or 82, somewhere in that time frame, they started indexing this group of, of goods and services. And, and so back in 82, this 309.57 would have represented that back in 1982, that same 100 uh, group of goods and services would have been $100. But in today, 2019, it represents $309. So it just shows you the rate of inflation that builds, you know, each and every year, basically. All right. So if we take mm -hmm. those numbers, FY, first off, uh, when do you get the CPI numbers for FY24? We're going to get them in July. And then by August is when your tax and revenue will release what that 
CPI number is. And are those CPI numbers the federal CPI number or just the CPI the in West Virginia? Yes, done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Yes. All right. So when we divide 24 by 19, FY24 by FY19 numbers, we get a multiplier yeah. of 1.223. 1.2223. Yeah. yeah, three twos there. Okay. Yes. And then we do what with that number? We multiply that by? Yeah, you multiply that by the fiscal year 2019 general revenue. Okay. And then that gives you a number of 5248 million four hundred fifteen thousand three hundred and thirty four okay and that's the number that you're looking to see if it is less than what your total general revenue is for the year that you're in then that will determine if you're going to have a tax cut so it has to be less okay okay so our fiscal, go ahead i'm sorry yeah but you but you have to back out the severance tax uh, revenue first yes you always back out the the, the uh, severance tax so we, we take the fiscal year 24 revenue, total revenue that we have for fiscal year 24. In our case, it was $5,710,575,000. I'm just rounding here. And then you back out the severance tax of uh, 368 million. That left you 5341000000 million, and that is slightly higher than what that multiplier effect. So that's why you're seeing a tax cut. Yes, the multiplier gave you five point two four eight billion, and yes. that difference is ninety three uh, million two two hundred eighty five thousand six sixty six roughly. That's correct. So how do we get a what what makes us uh, get a percentage of four percent from that figure of ninety three million two hundred eighty five thousand? Yeah. So then you take that ninety three million that that's the tax cut, and then you take the total collections of personal income tax for the year and in our case it was 2.2 billion and you just take 2.2 billion divide by 93 million and you get an answer of 4.16 percent so they round it down to four percent that's your four percent tax cut that's what the trigger is allowing that seems sense? pretty simple to me <laughs> it does make sense now that i see this formula it doesn't seem that hard or complicated now as long now, as i wanted to, i promise you i wanted to send it out to you for clarity uh, I've also promised Hike that I would uh, delegate Hike that I would send him a copy. You were the first person. I'm going to send it out to obviously Hike Hornby, everybody in the Eastern Panhandle. That way they can uh, just use it for future reference. But that's how you determine what that trigger is. And remember that multiplier. You know your CPI. People will say, well, what happens if the CPI decreases? Well, you don't want to see a decrease because you know you don't want to see it the same as 2019 or uh, things are starting to hit the fan, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because you want to see a little bit of rate of inflation uh, every year, you know, 1% or 2%, because you know then that the economy is moving, you know, people are getting wage increases. You don't want to see zero inflation or deflation, or then we're, we're in serious problems. The economy is starting to collapse or whatever. So if you look at that fiscal year 29 uh, CPI number at 309.57, Every year, that number should just gradually climb. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this that makes sense. So, who helped come up with all the math for this? Uh, tax and revenue put a lot of this together. Uh, so, you know, I talk, I worked with uh, Dr. Peter Shirley. Uh, Peter Shirley is a uh, back uh, several years ago. I wanted to, you know, I felt like we weren't getting a, a fair. Um, Whenever we asked for fiscal notes, we always relied on the agency for fiscal notes. So I thought, okay, why don't we have our, our own internal um, a group that could give us fair numbers, a fair reflection of what a bill was actually going to cost us. And so the legislature passed the bill. I forget my bill number, but uh, we hired Dr. Peter Shirley. He's an economist, Ph.D., and uh, I told him what I was looking for. You know, him and I work together. He put a lot of this together. So I see these numbers, and they are pretty clear as to why it's a 4% tax cut. How does the yeah. governor then come in and say we can do another 5% on top of that? Well, remember, the governor was one. Originally, we passed, the House passed a 30% tax cut. I think the governor was just trying to get close to what we had originally passed once before. And in his belief, 
he wanted he asked he has asked us if we would do an additional five percent. So and that's basically where we're at. I don't believe that it's going to happen. I believe right now the cautious approach is just to follow the trigger. There are several parameters. If you do want to do the additional, the governor even recommended it. I've recommended on this radio station. There's a $590 million surplus. Take half of that surplus and park it in the personal income tax reserve fund if you're going to do another 5%. To have the backstop, to have some protection. But I don't know if the legislature is even willing to do that. But it's, it's prudent if you're going to do it. So during the uh, the finance committee meeting, we had a, a number of uh, folks presenting numbers, Eric, and they kept really insinuating that uh, the the legislator still has the ability to sp- to appropriate another six hundred forty million this year. That that kept coming up over and over, no matter who was speaking. Uh, is, is that your assessment too? There's that there's an additional six hundred forty million that that you think the governor maybe tried to spend this year. That is always the case. Remember, any time, whenever the governor has to stay at the state address and he presents the budget to you, and we'll just use round numbers here, say that uh, Patrick Morrissey comes out as governor next year at the state of state, and he gives the legislature a budget of $5 billion. That's his spending for the, for the year, for the fiscal year 26. You, the legislature, it's your role and your duty to obviously to create law and to appropriate money. If you decide to only appropriate $4.7 billion of that $5 billion budget, there's $300 million of it that now becomes general revenue unappropriated. So it's, you know, it is the legislature's purview if they want to spend up to the, to the amount of the budget. We can't overspend. The only way that it can we can spend more is the governor would have to raise the revenue estimates he presented you with a budget uh there was a bunch of bills that were passed and they're coming in at 5.2 billion the governor would then have to raise the revenue estimates and we would have to have the revenue to cover it and that that would be the only way that you could exceed the the budgetary amount that was given to you by the governor so does that make sense perfect sense to me now this is this is general revenues. Uh, these are general revenues, and this is the general revenue budget. And this yeah. is this is what you debate in sessions with uh, the Senate and the governor. What about the other revenues that come into the state for highway funds yeah. and education funds and and such? Who's in charge of watching those and budgeting those? We are as well. It's, it's the whole role of the legislature. We you you, you have a. Uh, a gas tax that comes in. You have a privilege tax. is called a privilege tax. is the is basically a sales tax on vehicle. You have federal funds that are, that are coming in, and every month we're actually every day we, we're given a report of the daily revenues that are coming into the state, and we're also given a daily report of the revenues coming in from the gas tax and the and the privilege tax. Like for instance, on as of eight twenty eight right now. Um, you know, our total estimates for the year, for the month of, excuse me, our total estimates for the month of August uh, is right around $408,995,000. As of 8-28 today, or yesterday, we're, we're in at $387 million. So we're still about $21 million off of what our estimates are. We still have another two more days to go. I didn't get a chance to look at the uh, revenue numbers for the uh, – you know, for the highway side, but, uh, I mean, they normally, they finish fairly close. You know what I mean? So, Eric, I would say there's nobody in the House that knows our budget better than you. You've been doing a long time. You were finance chair. Uh, do you think we can afford a fi- another 5% um, tax cut and still be able to give increases to teachers and, and, and state workers moving forward? So that's a two-part question. If you want to do 5%, additional 5%, something that I've been harping on, um, you've got to figure out what are the priorities of the legislature. If the legislature wants to do an additional 5% tax cut, you're going to have to be prudent. You're going to have to take half of that surplus. You're going to have to park it into the PIT. You, you will not be able to do additional pay raise. You're going to have to start slowing your rate of spending down in the House 
uh, and on the Senate side to make sure that you don't have any issues. And, that, and that's been a problem. You know, uh, there's always a lot of great ideas out there. Everybody wants to create a bill or, or a law that uh, that costs the state money. But we really have to sit down. If you're serious about eliminating the personal income tax in West Virginia, you need to start controlling your rate of spending. Because if you don't, you'll never be able to achieve it. And these triggers are in effect each and every year, correct? That's correct. That's so correct. If, if even if we didn't do an additional 5%, there could be there is a possibility there could be another tax cut next year. Absolutely. Or a so 4%, 3%, whatever, the, whatever that uh, formula tells us. Well, in step two, step two, your fiscal year, you take the fiscal year, your total revenue, whatever your year that you're in, Remember, you want to see those total revenues, general revenues totals, increase. So, so for fiscal year 24, we saw 5.7 billion. So you want to see more money coming into the state. Remember the old axiom: if you want more of something, you're supposed to tax less of it. Okay. So you're putting you're putting economic theory to the test here. So in order to get a tax cut, you've got to see those total general revenues grow, because you're seeing growth in the economy. More, more investments in the state of West Virginia, more job creation, more people going back to work. And then you'll start to see those general revenues grow. And that's how you're going to continue to have the trigger to have a, a, a tax cut. Because if the general revenues drop, guess what? You're not going to see a tax cut. House Majority Does that Leader make sense? Eric Halsett, our guest here on the program. Eric, is there any type of formula that has been constructed in economic development to determine that this many new jobs coming into the state equals this much revenue for the state? Well, I'm sure the state tax office and I'm sure your uh, commerce division, you know, they always work together. I, I mean, I haven't seen one, but we always see totals like uh, t tourism has boosted the West Virginia economy by a billion dollars or whatever that figure may be. You know, so we, we, we see stuff like that. So someone is putting something together. I've never seen how they come up with those actual dollars or numbers, but I'm sure there's something out there. Because you want to, if you want to re uh, completely erase the state income tax, you've got to find a way to come up with, what, $2 billion in revenue every year, correct? Yeah, at least $2.3 billion. So the, the conversation has been a personal consumption tax. Now, you know, at some point, you may need to switch to a higher personal consumption tax, and uh, that gives you the benefit to choose what you want to purchase, obviously, um, what, whether or not you want to be taxed. But uh, at this point, with, if we stick to the trigger me mechanism, it's going to be a slower, more methodical, more protection then it allows you to see that growth. It allows you to see new job creation, more investments into West, Virginia, in, into West Virginia, and that's what you want to see. You want to be able to grow the economy slowly, and this is what should offset and pay for your, your tax cuts. But if the legislature starts, you know, spending more money, then obviously, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have issues. And that's the key, is really to control your rate of spending. So we have three new companies that were announced yesterday that are coming into West Virginia. Uh, the two in Berkeley, uh, the one in Berkeley County has two plants that'll go online in 25 and in 26. So that assumes more revenue being generated in West Virginia. Absolutely, yeah. 220 new jobs are projecting. So 220 more people buying goods and services, real estate, transportation, gas, new vehicles. You know, mm -hmm. you name it. All right. So I guess that's the reason why I was asking about if there's some type of formula as you continue to recruit new companies to come into West Virginia. Do you, in effect, get closer to the day when you can d completely get rid of the personal income tax? Or does the mere fact that more people are coming in just simply put more of a demand on services? Therefore, you need more tax revenue to keep those services active. Well, that's what I, uh, I keep harping on. The legislature has to decide what their priorities are. If, is it roads? Is it education? Is it health care? Is it uh, we're going to keep continue the welfare state? I mean, so those are going to be tough decisions that the next legislature is going to have to decide over the next couple of years. Obviously, uh, I think most of us want clean water, clean air, good roads. 
access to good health care, access, you know, we want to, and uh, well, job creators are looking for an educated workforce. So those are all decisions that Delegate Haidt and Hornby and, and my other colleagues moving forward, they're going to have to make those tough decisions and decide and to make those balances. So, look, we have our citizens wanting more money, more free, economic freedom. You know, so how do we strike that balance without, uh, you know, um, creating such a, a increase in spending that we jeopardize reducing the personal income tax or the, the, the opportunity to reduce and eliminate the personal income tax? Does it matter when a company's moving into a location whether or not it's a personal income tax or it's a consumption tax that generates revenue? In other words, is, is one more attractive to somebody moving into the state, be it a business or an individual, than the other? I think individuals will tell you they would like to move to a state without a personal income tax. I mean, when I visited Seattle, when we took the, the trip up to meet with Boeing and with Amazon, you know, you're in a tech state right there at good-paying jobs. Uh, they have no uh, personal income tax. So you're seeing that attraction of high-paying jobs, and uh, that's just another example of not having personal income tax. I think it makes you – and I think that's the message of Patrick Morrissey. Uh, you know, he mentioned yesterday that he wants to have like a uh, – he uses this analogy of a backyard brawl, you know, between WVU and Pitt. He, he wants to have a backyard brawl in a sense of – determining the competition with with our neighboring states. I mean, if we're going to win this race, we have to be better than our neighboring states around us if we want to see an influx of people, if we want to see good-paying jobs, because that's what's going to take to attract these job creators and to attract someone to take that risk and start a new business. How much money does the sales tax bring in in West Virginia, roughly, ballparked, Eric, yeah. you know? Uh, roughly, I believe it's almost $2 billion. Uh, for this month. We're estimating, for the month of August, we estimated $162 million. And so far to date, we've brought in $165 million. So as Swarm be sitting here, if you pull out his calculator, take $165 million times 12, and that'll give you a little, but it's usually around $2.2 billion, I think. Okay, so you, it's roughly even with the personal income tax, close. Yeah, it's pretty close. It, 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 it could be like $100 million less, $200 million less, but it's pretty close. So if you wanted to eliminate the personal income tax and replace it with a consumption tax, you're looking at having to double the sales tax rate to 11 or 12% in the state? You, you could, yes. You could. Would that get passed? <laughs> Uh, probably not. Be, uh, <laughs> no, that would not pass yeah. the House, Rob, yeah. in my opinion. No, no, no. no but, but it goes back to, you know, consumption taxes. You know, now people will argue consumption taxes are harder on the poor uh, because it makes – but it's also the most fairest tax as well, too, because everybody's equal. So if you go in to buy a can of pop, everybody's paying the sales tax. I mean, one of the issues that I've argued right now, we have – We've exempted a billion dollars worth of sales tax that's sitting on the, the, the sidelines right now because we have a good lobbyists that are coming in and advocating for this certain business, like that radio station that, that's broadcasting today. And on that note, we've got to stop our <laughs> show, our interview today. We're out of time. I, Eric, I do, I am really out of time. I appreciate yours yeah. today. Thanks so much, man. Much appreciated. Yep. Yeah. See you guys. Bye. Thanks, Eric.